There is a photograph almost all of you have seen and probably remember. It's a terrible photo, really. It shows the dead body of two-year-old Syrian refugee, Aylan Kurdi. The picture was taken in 2015, at the height of the European refugee crisis. And when I look at this photo today, I cannot help but think of my own daughter building a bridge between my own life and this tragic event, bringing me closer and helping me feel. There's a map most of you have seen, but probably do not remember. It is a version of one of many that was published across the internet to show the scale of this tragedy. Every circle on the map shows where people have died in the Mediterranean. Circles are sized based on the number of deaths. Maps like this one are an extremely powerful language we have to communicate the scale of some of the most important issues we face. A scale that a picture alone cannot capture. But maps have a built-in weakness. The more data that is shown on the map, the more it has to be simplified to remain legible to its reader. And in this process of simplification, of abstraction from the reality, maps lose this unique ability to make us feel. Today, I want to show you one of the most exciting frontiers in the world of map making. A new way to make maps that not only help us understand an issue, but also help us feel it. But first, I need to bring you back to where this journey started for me. So picture this. An old stone house on top of a hill surrounded by green forests. Fields with cows in them, small vineyards and in the summer, the sound of crickets. This is where I grew up, in the middle of nowhere, rural friends. It was an incredibly beautiful place. As a child, it could be incredibly boring too. <laughs> now, if there are any parents listening and you want to raise creative children, consider raising them in a boring place. My brother and I would spend entire days unleashing our wildest ideas in these forests, building tree houses and networks of suspended bridges in the treetops. Looking into the forest, my mind would constantly be solving visual puzzles, finding the best ways to combine tree branches, ropes and planks to build a magical world for myself. Map making requires a similar blending of engineering and creativity. And this is what I love the most about maps. They bring together these two worlds that normally are quite far apart. The structured, rigorous world of science and mathematics, and the more free, creative and abstract world of the arts. Now, for a long time, I believe, if I make maps for people to help to understand an issue, they're going to be inclined to take action and solve it. Some of you will say, Levi, this is very naive of you, and I don't blame you, I did grow up in the forest. But me too. After some time, I realized, if you want to inspire action, you cannot just reach for people's heads. You need to find a way to touch their hearts. When it comes to the European refugee crisis, for example, it wasn't enough for me to make a map to help you understand that thousands of people have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. I needed to find a way to make you feel it. Here was my attempt to do that. I stretched the Mediterranean Sea apart and flattened destination countries, Spain, Italy and Greece, to thin dark lines. By doing so, I'm trying to put you, the reader of the map, in the inflatable rubber boats with the refugees. These are the thin dark lines representing the safe havens they were trying to see on the horizon. 
The main geographical elements of the story are still there. The reader quickly sees that there are three migration routes and that the central one, from Libya to Italy, is also the deadliest. Instead of aggregating death counts in proportional circles, I decided to place one point on the page for each death. By doing so, making the individual bodies visible on the map. Thin blue lines of waving text tell the story of some of the accidents in the database. Here is one of them. Rescued of Lampedusa. Boat adrift for four days in crossing. Two pregnant women died. Their bodies abandoned at sea. It leaves us imagining the untold stories behind the, all the other thousands of dots on the maps, bridging from understanding to empathy. Now, in this process of trying to advance the language of cartography, I started to collaborate with historical geographer Anne Knowles. She is a pioneer in Holocaust studies. The Holocaust is one of these historical events I find very difficult to wrap my head around, let alone my feelings. Many maps on the topic use arrows of different thickness to show how Jews were moved from ghettos to concentration and extermination camps, telling us very little about their experiences. We wanted to challenge the status quo. I started by reading hundreds of pages of Holocaust survivor testimonies and slowly one thing became clear. The most important places to understand the Holocaust were small. And this makes sense. These are the places where people's senses, such as sight, hearing, and smell, are active. Places that anchored survivors' memories in the landscape. A street corner, a pit in the forest, a cattle car. I had a big problem. I had no idea where these places were located in the real world. How could I map them? This problem, this visual puzzle, was a unique opportunity for innovation. I need to find a new way to bring together the sciences and the arts. I turned to a field of mathematics called topology. Even though I did not know where the places were located in the real world, I knew where they were located relative to one another. I started by extracting this web of topological relationships from the testimonies and slowly build a map. First, I mapped all the camps and cities for which we did had coordinates. Then, just as I distorted the Mediterranean map, I distorted the map of Europe, making cities and camps larger to, to make room for the smaller but important places. In total, I mapped 628 places, mentioned by only two survivors, Anna Patipa and Jakob Brotman. This map shows much more than how they moved during the Holocaust. It shows how they experienced it. Here is Peresin, a small town in Czechoslovakia where survivor Anna Patipa grew up. I simplified the map for the purpose of this talk but you get the idea. The places she mentions most often are most opaque. She describes, for example, in great detail, the configuration of her house, the bed in which her mother laid sick, the bedrooms they had to give up to officers at the beginning of the war. Here is Auschwitz, a place we all have heard of. Both Jakob Brotman, shown in green, and Anna Patipa were eventually deported there. Instead of drawing places perfectly on the computer, I decided to draw each by hand. By doing so, making the uniqueness of each place visible. As our eyes set on labels such as camps, railroad tracks, crematorium, our brain starts painting pictures of these places based on our personal associations with these words, as if we're building a bridge between our own world 
and the lives and experiences shown on the map, bringing us closer and making us feel. This was much more than a map of the Holocaust. It was a new grammar in the language of cartography that could be used and scaled to many more testimonies or applied to other issues. Recently, for example, I started to work with Arctic indigenous Sami reindeer herders, helping them build their own topological maps to show the interconnectedness between their lives and the environment, but also how they're threatened. Maps are one of the few languages we have to communicate the scale and the complexity of some of the most important issues we face. Climate change, environmental pollution, wars. When I told a friend about my idea for this talk, she asked me, but Levy, isn't the problem that we're constantly fed with so much information that we've become desensitized to it? And I agree, I feel this myself. But this is also why my message to you is so important. Communication remains essential if we want people to take action and solve some of these issues. But we need to evolve our languages. We need to find new ways that bridge from understanding to empathy. Whatever languages you use, consider if you're using them to their full potential. There might be an opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to reach deep down into your own childhood forest and find a new, more profound, more beautiful way to connect us with your message, a way that bridges from understanding to empathy, a way that makes us feel. Thank you. <laughs>